Sometimes it sounds like a broken record, but I do like to say over and over again, whenever we're teaching Tozer, or we're doing a video of Tozer teaching that, this isn't about you. Well, let's just say, it is about you in one way. It's about you examining yourself. You see, when we're using Tozer teaching, uh, this one happens to be renewed day by day. It's just a daily devotional by Tozer. But any Tozer devotional that I've been using in video Tozer teaching, in that kind of ministry, what we've been doing is examining ourselves. We're not looking at someone else and saying, oh, you should do this. No, that's not what it's about. What we are about is challenging ourselves, looking at ourselves, delving into who we are, and saying, God, help us so that we could be more like He is. Because God is the one who is at work in us, both to do and to will of His good pleasure. So He is able to accomplish what He wants daily with us if we are willing to walk with Him, if we are willing to talk with Him, if we are willing to give Him our lives and not just some token service. And that's why we chose Tozer, because Tozer identifies all those areas where we are sketchy or kind of fleshy on our surface religious issues, but begins to discuss the hard issues of a real relationship with God. And you and I know there are lots of areas we don't want to talk about, isn't there? So because we're pursuing that area and we're going after those areas that are in darkness, that we hide inside those closets we don't want anybody to see, we try to be a little more honest. We try to be a little more real. So, if you have a problem with that, don't watch the video. Wow, he's actually saying don't watch? Yeah, don't watch. Go somewhere else. Go get simplified teaching so that you don't challenge yourself too much to condemn yourself in such a way because you know, as well as I do, you're a sinner. <laughs> yeah, you. There's nothing righteous about you. As a matter of fact, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, and you, boy, you know, we know where you're at, don't we? Because you're just like me. And I know where I'm at. <laughs> I'm saved by grace and there is not a shred of any righteousness that's in me. Because in me there dwelleth no good thing. But I know that who is in me makes the reality of what is in me so much more so that it will accomplish through me all the things that God wants to do to me so that someday I'll be presented faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. Because I trust in Him to do it. I don't try to fix it myself. I let Him do it. And that's why we challenge ourselves in a way that brings the reality of a personal Jesus to each one of us. We have to sit down and not talk to other people about what their problem is. We have to talk to other people about what they see our problem is so that they can help us for us to change ourselves and present it before God so that He could develop us into what we ought to be, especially if we want to pursue being like Jesus. Because if that's your goal, then come along. Jesus knows all about you and still loves you. Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28, 18. Have you ever heard one of our modern Christian activists say, Oh, I don't know, but you know, I think I'll find a doctrine that's even deeper, or this is more important than then, you know, we need to get the true Christians right. You know, we need to fix the doctrine of salvation. We need to get this right so that we're giving the right gospel, the right salvation message. We need to make it true so that we get true Christians and true repentance. And they're all about what is true. There's only one answer to this kind of true quest. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and commit yourself fully to Him. Because He is God and He is Lord. He is Christ, and He is the Redeemer. He is the one whom we all will stand before, the Son. The same yesterday, today, and forever. In these matters of spiritual blessing and victory, we are not dealing with doctrines. We're not dealing with dogmas. We're not dealing with ideas. We're not dealing with scriptures. Bluntly, we are dealing with the Lord of all of all doctrine, of all word, of all knowledge, of all wisdom, of all things that we have been told directly by Him to do. He is the one we have our salvation with. So He is the one that determines for us if we're saved. Because reality check is, we don't have a relationship with Him. On the day we stand before Him, He'll say, Depart from me, I never knew you. 
But if we do have a relationship with him, then he shall say, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundations of the world. For when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. You did those things I told you to do. But is it enough to just do those things without actually talking to Jesus? Of course not. Because you see, even the heathen do that. See, the heathen will go out and they will visit people in prison. The heathen will go out and even visit and take care of the poor and needy. The government will do all those things, literally, because they have counselors and they have people. And we even know that there are cults and false religions that will do the same. Do not the Mormons do the same? Do not other religions likewise visit theirs in prison and feed the poor? As a matter of fact, don't some of the other false religions do a better job than Christians? I mean, look at Islam. Wow, they do a great job. Look at Jews. Whoa, boy. <laughs> they take care of their own. Oh, what are we talking about? Mormons? Oh, yeah. What about them too? So you see, except the Lord build the house, the workman laboreth in vain that builds it. For except God tells you to go to prison and visit someone, you aren't really doing something with Jesus, are you? You're doing it for Jesus. Do you get the point? When you decide to go out and strike out on your own, so to speak, you're never on your own. Because if you're not working with God, you're working against Him. Because Jesus said, whoever's not for me is against me. Whoever is for me can receive nothing except it comes from my Father. So don't forbid them. Don't stop them from doing what they're doing because it may have been that God has given them some gift and some ability if they are called by my name. But don't stop them. You be concerned with me. So you see, it's about our personal relationship with God. As we know Jesus, as we are following in His footsteps, as we walk with Him and talk with Him, as He walks in front of us and literally walks into a jail cell, we walk with Him to that jail cell and minister. Because if you try to do something without the Spirit of God in you, you'll never see where Jesus is. And if He leaves, you're there. Guess what? You ain't supposed to be where He ain't. And if you are, then guess what? You're not protected by the same token that he is already moved on and you need to be with him. So we need to establish some parameters or some places where we understand what's being said here. Having a relationship means you're talking to a person. You're dealing with them. You're understanding their directions. You're doing what you're told, when you're told, how you're told, with what you're told. Because it's not enough to just simply sit down and say, oh, well, you know, I read my Bible. Well, that's nice. So does every other person in the world. There's so many theological people out there that are going to argue all kinds of hermeneutic and homiletic, and they can tell you exactly what to do for every moment of your life. They can tell you exactly what the right doctrine is. Oh, just follow me and send me twenty nine ninety five, and I'll tell you exactly what the right doctrine is. Oh, let's go to Bible school to make sure that we got it all covered because we have all the exposition analysis of exegesis of the word in such a theoretical way that we can theologically give you a master's degree, a dogma, a PhD. Isn't that nice? None of that will help you develop a personal relationship with God. The only thing that will help you a personal relationship with God is Jesus himself. You go to Jesus and you ask him. Because Jesus made it simple. Ask and you would receive. Seek and you would find knock and the door will be open. Because you see, in the letters to the seven churches, Jesus wrote to every kind of church that there was in the world at his day. He wrote to every kind of church that would ever be in all of time. He wrote to every kind of church that there would ever be in our day. And it was called the letters to the seven churches. And in those letters, he spoke to those that overcame. Because in each one of those, we are found, or else we're not found in him. Because he's in the midst of the seven churches. The midst of the seven menorahs, the midst of the seven candelabras. He is in the midst of his people. And his people are in the church. Let that be a warning. Think about that. You may want to consider that. Because there are those that don't assemble together and they think that they're okay. Are they? Or are they in rebellion? We know better based upon our studies as we've gone through the video Vidivo teaching on Tozer. In these matters, how can we be so ignorant and so dull that we try to find our spiritual answers and abounding life by looking beyond the only one who has promised that he would never change? You see, 
Man is always coming up with new ideas about what we should do. The four spiritual laws. Wow, let's go tell the four spiritual laws. You have to admit that you're a sinner. Really? Did they do that back in Jesus' day? No, they didn't, did they? Wait a minute. What was, what was the four spiritual laws in 3 AD? 4 AD, 6 AD, 30 AD, 10 AD? When did the four spiritual laws get written? Gee, I wish I didn't know the answer because, you see, I was around when they wrote it. Ooh, Bill Bright? Oh, wow. And why did he write those four spiritual laws? I think he was graduating from theology school and he wanted to write something that was simple to be able to explain it in order to use it for Campus Crusade for Christ and it became a wide tool to be used by those who were using the Word of God in order to present the Gospel to people who didn't know how to do it. He wanted to do it in a simpler way. Oh, well, let's take the Roman road. Roman road? Can't we just do what Jesus said? You see, there are lots of ways that people have come up with to save someone because they think they're doing it rather than God doing it. Literally, Jesus just simply said, go out. The fields are white with harvest. You don't have to do anything. Just harvest. Just bring them in. Bring them in. Bring them in. If you're doing what I told you to, you know, sitting down, discipling them, teaching them all nations, whatsoever things I've told you, if you're actually taking the time to care about them, to dis discern what their needs are to meet with them and treat them as though I were personally involved in their life and that I'm inside them and that you care about me and that you'd want me living with you for a couple of years in order to get you grounded like I do with my disciples in order that you would understand what the gospel is what the salvation message is what God is what the Holy Spirit is what we are as being born again Christians are then you are finding out that I've already got people out there just waiting for you to invite them into the kingdom of God by simply saying hey Come, for the spirit of the bride say come, and he that is thirsty come, let him come and drink of the water that I will give. For all they need to do is pray, ask, and they receive. But, no, Lord, we don't want to make that commitment. We want to kind of make a general overview statement of salvation so that we could cover all the people. So we'll just throw out a net and we'll pull in the bottom fish, the top fish, We'll pull in seaweed, we'll pull in boots, we'll pull in all kinds of things because after all, we're just casting out the net of our own theology. So we bring in all kinds of fish and some last and some perish and some are saved and some choose not to be saved because as we're told by the parable, some, when the word of God went into their heart, rejected it. Here's the world. Sorry, got them caught up. So you understand the point? Personal is as personal does. If Jesus is personal to you, then when you share with someone the gospel, you be personal. Because Jesus saved people one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't save thousands. All the thousands came just to see miracles. The thousands came to get food. The thousands came to watch this miracle man do his thing and to teach wonderful things. But what did he do when it came time to bring it down and narrow the message down. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. And the people were grieved and sorrowful. Oh, we can't do that. And they didn't follow him anymore. Even the 70, because it says to the 12, he said, would you leave also? Not to the 120, not to the 70. They were gone. They were like, man, we're out of here. We don't do, we don't do this, you know, eating flesh stuff. And Peter spoke up and said, where will we go? You have the words of life. Man, we've given up everything, you know. If this is it, this is it. We followed a cult leader and I guess you're it. And John, John, and then Jesus said to him, Flesh and blood is not revealed to you, but my but the Spirit of God, my Father in heaven is revealed to you by his spirit. So that Peter would know that he wasn't a brainiac, but that at that moment God intervened to show them, Look, I'm with you. I'm showing you. You'll get it. But that's the point. It was personal. Jesus and Peter. How personal are you? How real are you? If you're having a personal relationship with God, then what are you doing by being impersonal in your ministry? Shouldn't it be personal to the person? Shouldn't you get real with a few people? Shouldn't you be caring about just maybe even, like we say here on Vidivo, if but for one, then we'll do it in the name of the Son. But if but for two, 
hey, it's up to you. Sorry. We're out here just doing this because if only one person is inspired, if only one person turns to Jesus, if only one person wants an intimate and personal relationship with Jesus in a better way that they've never experienced before, then we've done our job and that's all we need to do. That's what God has told me to do. That's why I'm inspired and thrilled with being able to share the things that go on in my life and to record them and then to share the teachings that I've learned from, I'd like to say Nehi, but that would be knee high in the spirit because I was already 17 years old when I got saved. I think I turned, no, I didn't turn 18 yet. I was 17. By golly, saved in 1974. Jesus movement, man, we we're all the way. Hey, concerts, whoa, went to a concert, bingo, got saved, miraculously splashed down, splash up, went through, gush gosh, and I was already on my way. <laughs> God gave me all kinds of gifts and spirit and everything else that manifested itself in my life that was like, whoa. What happened to him? <laughs> and then reality came crashing down when I nearly died three times and went through 10 years of misery and suffering in order to make applicable by experience the Word of God that had been placed inside me so that I would become strong in the Lord to be able to minister to the body of Christ as opposed to being ministering to just one sect, one segment, one little church, one little person, one little whatever. Anybody, come on out, man. Talk to me. I don't care. Jehovah's Witness, come on over. You know, maybe. <laughs> Most of the time, I don't really invite them in because they don't come to my door anymore. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Hey, you want to talk? Come on over. We'll talk. I'll share Jesus. If you want to talk about Jesus, I'm all ears. You want to talk about anything else? You'll find me very boring. So. How long will it take us to use completely without reservation to this one who has made both Lord and G and Christ and yet continues to be the very same Jesus who still loves us with an everlasting love? In other words, since he knows what kind of decrepit, disgusting type of person we really are inside, and we don't know, <laughs> I know that because I can look around and see just how fast most Christians turn into that evil twin, you know, that wow, Provoke them, and guess what? Poke them a little bit, like you know the Pillsbury Doughboy, and man, they'll bite you. <laughs> They're like, put your finger out there. <laughs> they'll chomp on it. Man, it's like, excuse me, I just tested you with the spirit of love, you know, and you just came back at me with hate. Hey, back off, Jack. You got me for eternity. You know, I'm stuck with you, and you're stuck with me. You might as well get along now. <laughs> so you see, it's about person the person of Jesus, not the theology of doctrine and dogma. Though those things are important, we do need to have our dog doctrine and dogma correct in our lives, our own personal lives, not in the person out there, not pointing the fingers over there, not shouting out somewhere over there or giving some kind of like, oh, warning, warning, this is a warning. People out there are going to mislead you, so I'm going to tell you which ones are misleading you. They are going in the wrong direction. Warning, warning, warning. Oh, please. If God can't take care of his people, who can? You can't. That's the whole point of what the Jesus movement was about. We didn't worry about those things. We didn't care. Who cared? God's leading. <laughs> if God's leading, you don't worry about it. But you see, there's the issue, isn't it? Is God leading? Is he really that person? Is he able to tell you today what to do? Do you hear him? Do you hear his voice? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they will not follow the voice of another because, pardon me, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear, not let him read what the Spirit says. Hear? You mean, you're not talking about reading? No. Hear means hear. Read means read. Study to show thyself approved. A workman that need not, need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Study means read. What do you think hearing means? Let's just see if studying the word of God really means something to you. Do you think hearing means hearing? Or do you think hearing means reading? Because you see... The word isn't mistranslated. The word isn't changed from Greek to Hebrew to English. And then suddenly, you know, we discover by going to the Greek or the Hebrew that the word means to read. It doesn't mean to hear. No, it means to hear. Literally. It doesn't mean go to a pastor and listen inside of a church. 
though those things are meant to be in your benefit so that you would be in the congregation of those that associate themselves together so that the Spirit of God can lead you and guide you by that congregation of those that have come together that share the same faith and the same knowledge of Jesus Christ in your life so that they can instruct you and guide you and provide for you counselors and you know instruction and uh, direction and comfort and care. But there's a place also where in scriptures when God says here, He means here. He don't mean like here in this place, like standing here. He means hearing like in the ear. So if you aren't hearing His voice, I think that's why you're kind of going off on different tangents, you know. It might be why I see you going that way and you're supposed to go that way. You're not listening so good, are you? Ooh. So maybe I need to study a little more by reading so that I could get to the place where I am still and quieted my soul. Soul? You mean like my soul where I could get all my emotions in the way, I could get all my ideas in the way, I could get all this stuff in the way so that I can't hear God speak? Could be... Let's see. Be still and know that I am God. I speak in a still, small voice. I wonder how quiet you got to be to hear a still, small voice. Bringing every thought into captivity of Christ. Hmm, I wonder how I can shut down those thoughts. I wonder if I have to go find a prophet in order to speak to me. Please, not me's. A personal development is what you're going through. You gradually learn to hear his voice. You gradually learn to study, to know, to be approved unto God, a workman, not be ashamed, writing divine word of truth. But as you're more familiar with his word, then his spirit lives in you and your flesh becomes less so much dominant in your mind, your eyes, your heart, your hearing, and your speaking. And then as you become more graceful, gradually God brings you into a place of love and then you can hear these words of love that God is speaking because you see, since he knows you and he saved you, it's not because he had anything good about you, but it's because he loved you anyways. So I think if you got into the right track like love, then you probably are going to hear him a little better. But if you're kind of like out in left field and he's there at home plate, I don't think that you're really going to hear him too well because he doesn't shout. It's a still small voice, remember? I don't think that you're going to hear him out in left field until suddenly he shouts and gives a good shout out for judgment or wrath. So, pardon me, but I think that personal part, the reason why it's personal is because it's personal. What a novel idea! Personal means person. You know, like person to person. Ooh, really? You mean like listening and talking? I thought person to person was like one person dictates and the other person listens. Nah, I don't think so. Conversation and communication is what God does in the reality of our relationship that we have. Because if you don't have it, go get it. Because if you don't got it, you ain't going to get very far. <laughs> You're going to go walking right off the cliff. And believe me, you'll be falling off so many cliffs going, well, the pastor said, the teacher said, I thought I read that in scripture. You know, and I'm boom, fell flat on my face. You know, I'm getting kind of tired of making these mistakes, but thank God I was trained right that God said, you know what, as long as I keep making mistakes, I'm okay because the righteous man falls down seven times but rises up again. Oh, God expects us to make mistakes? He knows you. Remember that? That's how we started this? He knows you. He loves you. What father, loving a child, sees that child when they're walking, fall down, walking for the first time, and doesn't go running over and help pick up the child and helps it to start again? What father, even when that prodigal son is gone, doesn't welcome the child back with open arms. You see, if you don't understand what a father's love is, you really don't understand who God is. And you got to have a father that loves you. Because if you didn't, 
then you're going to have to decide that God is love. And that love is manifested by Him willing to give His Son to die for you, even when you didn't like Him at all. That's how we are to be. That's why you really don't have any enemies in this world, because you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Sorry, you can't go against the Muslims. You can't go attacking, you know, the Mormons. You can't go picking out your enemies. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Not at all. You wrestle against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, all those things that are causing those people to do those things because they're blind and they don't know any better. So you want to be praying for them. You want to be witnessing to them. You want to be loving them because guess what? God knows them too. And he knew you. And you got saved. And if you could get saved, ha! So can they too, huh?